creative part of this project, I think, is the way that it that you that you think about how you can use like a building, and you can also actually use it in in a strategy, a way to encourage children to to learn. I think that is an innovative part. I also think it's an innovative part in in India as well to think about going from very you could say strict formal learning as well as saying like okay also the way that you use your surroundings the way that you play also have is a part of um, of growing up and learning. What does it mean? Can architecture actually become, you know, a part of the memories that you associate with your development, with your uh, childhood? And could we actually create a building that would embed itself into the imagination of the children who go through the school? So how can a building be more than just uh, four walls and a roof? Can it be a landscape, for instance, that invites children to climb on it, to, uh, to kind of walk under it uh, into a kind of cavernous uh, space? How do you build uh, with a material that's available to you, which in this case was brick? And how do you uh, build that at its utmost efficiency? Uh, so this took us back to 16th century Spain, the Catalan uh, tile vaulting system, which was uh, in some sense almost forgotten for some time. Until Gustavino started doing these incredible vaults in the early 19th century. Then also we looked at the work of this engineer from Uruguay in the 1960s called Dieste, who was working with compression rings and how he would be able to do these fantastic cantilevers of walls, brick walls that would actually uh, be substantial. Coincidentally, we also found this software called Rhino Vault, which was being made by um, the university in Zurich called the ETH by the Block Research Group, where they were calculating the load-bearing capacities of uh, structures like these. We were following clues going from the 16th century to uh, 1960s to the current uh, work being done at the ETH and it all kind of was just joining the dots together to get to this point. So we always knew it will be using this brick tile in a structural manner. It was extremely critical that the contractor would follow the right shape. It is the shape at the end of the day that is giving it structural stability. It's making it pure compression. We came up with the idea to reuse rebars. What it does is it makes a shell kind of structure on which each course of brick is then laid. There were three layers of brick with geotextile membrane between each layer. The geotextile membrane basically takes care of lateral forces. And uh, the brick only thing that we had to be particular about is that no joints should overlap. There's a nano coating layer at the top. So nano coating basically doesn't allow the water to stay. It'll convert it into smaller pebbles and run off. We weren't just designing the building. We were designing the ecosystem around it or bring about a change in the lifestyle of few people. And the question was, could architecture do that? There is now an argument because of the way that we actually are situated where knowledge is no longer geographically locked, right? Knowledge is now available to everyone because of the internet, because of the way that we have knowledge networks that connect. That now you can actually look at local ideas, but look at global influences to make that uh, local more richer, make it more efficient in the case of, you know, maybe construction technique, or even push the idea of the regional or the local to evolve uh, beyond what it was maybe 100 years ago.